everybody. It's Monday, August 2nd. It's the first week of August and the last month of summer. So we decided to kick off August with a supersized episode discussing the intersection of creativity and automation. I'm one of your hosts, Cecilia Sepp. I'm the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips Nonprofit Consulting and Association Management Services. And I'm here with my co-host and friend, Agnes. I'm going to throw it over to Agnes to say hello. Thank you, Cecilia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Agnes Amos Coleman. I'm an author and a consultant. Over to you, Cecilia. Great. Thank you, Agnes. And we are here today with two of our favorite guests, which is why we're doing a supersized episode, because 15 minutes cannot hold all these ideas. So we're here with Bryant Richards and Mike Jacka. We're going to start with Bryant and have Bryant say hello and introduce himself. Hello. Thanks, Cecilia. Uh, my name is Bryant Richards. I am an Associate Professor of Accounting and Finance at Nichols College and excited to tell you that I am the Director of the Center for Intelligent Process Automation, which will be launching shortly. Thank you. Oh, Thank you for inviting me. Great. Thank you, Bryant. Uh, sorry to talk over you a bit, but that's just an exciting <laughs> program that's coming our way. So, Mike, over to you. Uh, say hello and introduce yourself. Hello and introduce myself. Oh, um, Mike Jack, <laughs> I am. Uh, I worked in internal audit for over 30 years, worked with farmers insurance in the last few years, basically been uh, doing independent stuff under Flying Pig Audit Consulting and Training Solutions, uh, writing and speaking and training. And the real good news is I've had my coffee this morning. All right. <laughs> and so have I, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to keep up with these two. So let's just mm -hmm. throw it right open. So we have Mike who likes to help people with creativity. We have Bryant, who's an expert in intelligent automation. And Mike, I'm not saying you're not an expert in creativity, so don't take it that way. But um, Bryant, let's start with you. Um, you had mentioned something about a great question for the audience to consider. What would you do if you had an idea and you could make that idea happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I think this is a great place to start with intelligent process automation. And I really appreciate it. What we find is working with folks is that once they understand uh, some of the readily available technology out there, like right now we're using NICE's Automation Studio Intelligent Process Automation tools, um, once they recognize how much capacity these tools have mm -hmm. um, to repeat clicks, to complete processes, to do logical functions, um, it really opens up their mind to what we could do. Not only what we could do to just sort of replace some work we don't like doing now, but what other things are really possible out there? And we're finding in some of the discussions that people's minds are sort of opening to this idea very quickly once they get through some automating some of the stuff they really don't like to do right now. Mm. Wow, that's great. So let's start over to Mike. So Mike, you had mentioned a concept related to this question Bryant raised of the citizen developer. Could you explain a little bit about that to the audience and how it might apply? Off what Brian was talking about, because he talked about a lot of the technologies, the different things going on out there. What is inherent within, and NICE is a perfect example, but there are a lot of other programs out there that are robotic process, automation, that are bots, all these technical things. Almost anybody can do them. You don't need uh, an IT background to figure out how to do this with just a little bit of understanding and training. You can suddenly do all these other things. Well, this gets to the concept of the citizen developer. The mm -hmm. citizen developer is the one who does not necessarily live in the professional IT world, but is can use tools to build what the department needs. For my, in my case, a number of years ago, I was involved in, we, we had some database issues, some things we wanted to do differently. So um, in internal audit, I trained myself to do some programming. I was Hold your hats on this one. I was a top programmer in Lotus 123 in our company. <laughs> what's you know that? what that is? You're as old as me. It was pre Excel. And anyway, the point is, I developed this and was able within our department without having to worry about IT other than getting the information from them, able to develop these programs. Well, this is the concept of citizen developer. You're basically pulling out that middleman of having to work with IT. You are mm -hmm. able within your own department to build the programs, build the tools, build the things to accomplish the things that Brian is talking about. Interesting. Yeah, and, and Cecilia and Agnes, if I can jump in on this too, one of the things that we've done is we've worked with a number of um, what I'll call business user RPA tools. And they've come out recently over the last few years where, where before that, the business user, the citizen developer really wasn't in the game. 
The mm. tools work really well now. They're much easier. Frankly, they're much cheaper. There's a lot of real accessibility in them. We've proved that at Nichols College by taking business students and training them on these tools, and they very quickly become functional citizen developers of sorts. So this isn't this isn't a pie in the sky concept. This is this is real based off of what's going on in industry right now. Interesting. Uh, Brian and Mike, I just, uh, again, I'm probably going to digress a little bit, but I'm interested in finding out how this shifting and changing in thinking actually does benefit the business. Uh, and when I say the business, I'm looking at, of course, our association community and our global community. So can you share your thought process on this? Can I go first? <laughs> go ahead. Good. I don't think I... <laughs> So, so thanks for that. So we've, we've actually done a ton of research on this, um, just looking at the thought leadership that's going on. And we're actually we're doing more. And although mm -hmm. I wouldn't say there's a conclusive opinion from this from our center at this point, what we're finding is a, a very important trends. And those mm -hmm. trends relate to organizations that approach this in what I'll call a, a person responsible or a talent responsible approach, which is they actually value their talent. Uh, they value their people. And they're not aiming to just try to replace jobs with automations. And what we're finding is that in those organizations that are, are leading in this automation journey um, approach, collaboration is much better. Mm. Innovation is much better. Uh, motivation is much better. And frankly, the, you know, actually collaboration outside of the organization is much better too. So what you're finding is that um, some of the punchlines that are coming through to us is that those organizations that automate some of the tedious things that people don't like to do um, or some of the tedious jobs that really aren't a good use or the best use of the talent we have in organizations, mm -hmm. very quickly, the people respond and deliver value. And so mm -hmm. um, I forget the gentleman's name from the London School of Economics, but he calls it the triple win. So the stakeholders win because they get more profits, the customers win because they get better service, but the employees win because they get better jobs and they respond to that. And that's, that's a trend that we think is important to understand and help our stakeholders um, know the roadmap and the plan for that, um, because I, I think that should be a really important outcome of, of this, this um, industrial revolution. Interesting. Mike? Well, I'll just, uh, again, build on that. And Brian, I think this is your line you stole from somebody else. The big thing is it replaces the clickety-click with the thinkety-think. Isn't that the mm. correct phrase? Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and so to, to Brian's point, you suddenly have people able to use their brains to do more than just click and do mundane tasks. You're taking them and by, and by giving them this, you're building a greater pride in what they do. And they're mm -hmm. wanting to do their jobs and doing their jobs better. And then to the other part also, the other benefit to the organization is one more time. You're right there again with that citizen developer. You are right there with the person who wants to, who understands it and understands how to get it done. And they, they are able to look at things differently. Even when you're working with IT, they're still in this tunnel vision. I had a time when, wow, it turned into a story. Imagine that working with somebody from IT with trying to get claims information. Mm -hmm. And I said, we were saying, we need this claims information. He kept saying, why do you need it? Well, first off, you don't need to know why I need it. I've got this, but we started to explain it to him. And he was a former claims guy. He was making excuses for, well, it would show this, this, yes, we know, but we need the information. We need to be able to analyze it by you giving us this. So, you know, it's one more wall out of the way to effectively get the work done you need to get done. Yeah, and if, and I could just pile on that real quick too, especially for your audience. I I have a passion for nonprofits. One of the reasons I'm here, um, mm -hmm. as well as I've worked in them for a lot of years as well, um, whether it's on the board or, or actually working for them. And one of the things that's clear about nonprofits is that you know every person usually has six hats or mm -hmm. five hats. Like I mean, the that's pressure correct. to be lean, and, and we can talk about whether that's a functional pressure or not, but it is true. And all the nonprofits tend to respond to this, especially as related to the, the financial metrics, you know, salary versus service and, and whatnot that's, that's there. A citizen developer concept where nonprofits can actually deploy this in an inexpensive, low risk and effective way mm -hmm. will start unwinding um, some of those hats. And so for those of you who are listening and, and obviously for Cecilia, Agnes, imagine if you just wore one less hat what could you do to better serve your stakeholders? And I think mm -hmm. that answer should be, I mean, that, that's probably popping so many ideas already for the folks listening. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, and, and something that I always uh, 
I, I guess I'm just kind of surprised when people say, well, I have an idea, but I, I can't make it happen. And I think really off what Mike was saying, a lot of times other people that we think we need to work with will put up a wall or a barrier. Mm. And they say, well, you can't get there from here. And you have to like go around that wall or that obstacle. But I think a lot of times we also have to say, you know, how are we, how are we going to get around that obstacle in our own mind of how, how can we get something done? And, and that can be anything from like, using a tool in a different way, sort of like how Botox is now used to treat migraines, not mm -hmm. just wrinkles. Um, somebody figured that out. Uh, so how do we do that? So it's like, you know, Mike, you said they asked why, and you said, well, you don't really need to know why we just need to make this thing happen. But what are some good tips for, you know, what are some creative tips to intelligently get people to support? your new idea and doing something differently. I, you know, cause I think if somebody asks why that shows they have an interest and maybe it's mm -hmm. a deeper way to get them on board. And I think the biggest thing is just like everything else in the world, it's developing relationships. Mm -hmm. So again, in the work we did, um, obviously we were cutting out a lot of the programming that was required because we were doing it, but ultimately we still had to get the data. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges in any of this is do you know where that data resides? That meant we did have to still build relationships with those individuals to help learn. And we were working in, a, in an environment that had legacy systems running all over the place. So you'd have to run to 10, 12, 15 different people to try and get that answer. But nonetheless, that is a piece of it. And the other part is if you can get the mindset across that we are something doing something new, different, and creative mm -hmm. and beneficial, if you can market it that way to the people around you, I'll use the word market because it works best. Suddenly you will have them coming to you wanting to help be a part of that. So, it, I mean, you know, it's a piece of being creative and surrounding yourself with the creatives around you that, that come because of what you're trying to do. So like so much in life, really the key is relationship building. And then part two, marketing. And you know what, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. And within our association community, I think the value comes into understanding that we are trying to better the business for the members that we serve. And wrapping our heads around the fact that in what we do within the association community, it's about formulating, predicting data, you know, what the data does and how that data impacts our community. And the best way that we can do that is encourage that creativity, encourage that intelligent automation. And that could be the buy-in, you know, your members are here, the way we can service them better is if we use data as an output to help service them well. So I- important, it, An important role for anybody who is getting into this, maybe you're the first one in your organization, the first you know, of a few, Mm -hmm. That means, means you have that opportunity to be the champion for the organization, the champion for your department, to sell them on the role that this can have, and be, then be the champion throughout the organization as you are having wins, and they don't have to be big wins. When you read a lot of the literature, there's stuff about, oh, find those big wins that get you the ROI and all that. Well, yes and no. You can have a bunch of small wins that people mm -hmm. go, wow, how did they do that? And then you build from that. You know, you're, you're starting to you become that champion who says, this is the value of this. This is why our department, this is why our organization cares. And Mike, I'll jump in on that. One of the things that's really important about this tool that's so powerful we're finding is that it's, it's visual and it's real. So if you've mm -hmm. ever sat down at a brainstorming meeting or something, you're like, okay, let's, hear, let's call all these ideas. Well, it exists on a whiteboard. Well, this exists in reality. So what we're finding is that even we, if we do sort of what I'll call a bad proof of concept that just shows we can kind of do some of the things that we were talking about doing, well, that really like captures people's imagination. So that marketing piece is, let me show you we can actually do it. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think people who've been in industry a while, you know, hear a lot of stories about what systems can and can't do and all this type of stuff. Well, if a week later you talked about an idea and then you, you know, you punch it up on the screen, you hit a button and it works. Like people kind of, whoa. Let's and the, the, using uh, the, the whiteboard analogy there, an important thing to recognize is this is not just one of the technologies. They are, all, all of them are going to this ease of use, this visual, put it together, you can see it, bam, it runs. So mm -hmm. it's not any one. I mean, some are better at it than others. And if you are actually getting into this and wanting to explore the actual technologies, and you may, you know, you'll need to do a little bit of work to figure out which is best for your situation, but they all work into this. That, again, all the way back to the reason we can be citizen developers in this is the ease of use. 
almost no IT training. If you can figure out what if then else means, you're there. Right. And and then maybe you can better explain it to an IT guy if you need an IT person yeah. to really help you figure it out. And mm-hmm. you know, Mike, you you mentioned Lotus One Two Three, which uh, some people in the audience may not have ever heard of. Uh, It's very similar to web crawler. Uh, There's always a first generation of tools out there. And Lotus Mm -hmm. 123 was like Microsoft Office at the time. Um, I was on the last cusp of that as it breathed its last and we all moved to Microsoft or Apple. But the, the thing about that is that as we're going, you know, we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. I guess is the point I'm trying to make here. So you have to start somewhere. You start with Lotus 123 and then you build on something. And I think the concept, um, oh yeah, here's the point I really wanted to make. Let's come back to the the concept of the personal computer, right? The personal in computer, that, that was really kind of the point of it. You didn't need to go to the IT guy. You didn't need those big punch cards anymore. Um, if you've ever seen an older movie and they're trying to trace a phone call and you will see thousands of punch cards being sorted by a big sorting machine and and uh, like ENIAC used to take up an entire room uh, just to do one equation. So we've really advanced a lot. And that's really why we're doing that. Mike, you, you look I was like just going to say, some of us actually had to pass uh, computer college classes using punch cards. <laughs> and we walked uphill both ways. Go ahead. In the snow, <laughs> in our bare feet. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's really a good, uh, a good thing to bring up because how are we mm-hmm. being creative with what we have now? Um, I've actually met people who've never used a typewriter. Mm. And that was 20 years ago. They said, I don't know how to use a typewriter. Well, what do you mean you don't know how to use a typewriter? Everybody knows how to use a typewriter. No, they don't. Um, so when you're thinking about that, you also have to keep in mind how people relate to stuff when you're mm-hmm. trying to be creative with things. Um, also, how do you, I, I, I'm going to start with Brian on this one, and then we'll throw it over to Mike and then Agnes. I'd love to hear what you think. How do you get over other people's fear factor? Like I'm a person who's always like, let's just do it. And people are like, no, wait. And then I just hit that button anyway, and it happens. So mm-hmm. I, you know, how do you get past the fear factor? Yeah. Th- thanks for that. I, I think there's a, th- that question could be unpacked for a while. I, I want to jump to, I think, um, one of the things I've seen is very um, successful is um, having somebody go first mm-hmm. and then creating collaboration. And one of the things that I think should and can and will exist, especially in the nonprofit space, is a collaboration of folks who want to journey together. Mm-hmm. And whether it's tool specific or not, um, you know, one of the reasons we launched the Center for Intelligent Process Automation was we said, hey, we're going to push the button. We'll go first. Actually, that's our mission, right? We'll go do that. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to go check to see um, who wants to come with us, especially those who are either afraid or just reasonably evaluating and taking their time. And as we build that, that collaboration, what we're going to find is as long as there's someone out there who's willing to go first, is that we can sort of snowplow the path a bit and, um, and really leverage that collaboration. People can come behind us. They don't have to learn how to you know, create the automation, they might be able to just go borrow ours. We've already Mm -hmm. created them or something to that effect. So I I think sort of doing some risk management from my internal audit side of the world um, and and creating models that, you know, really help that, um, I think will be really successful for for all of these new technologies going forward. Hmm. And well, and and like what I like to say to people, if it doesn't work, we just won't do it again. Mm -hmm. There you go. So over to Mike. And Cecilia, I've got a feeling you're with me on this particular one. I have always been the type that's, uh, you know, ask forgiveness, not permission. Yep. And I will just tend to go do things. And you can talk to a few of my bosses about that offline, preferably. But, um, I, you know, even in what I did, first off, I had the tools there. So I literally just started doing stuff uh, mm-hmm. without, you know, I didn't, I didn't need to ask for anything. I was using any extra time I had to get it done until I had a proof of concept. But yeah, you know, you may not have that. But again, I will go back to if you're the one who wants to get this done and do it, find the small things. Um, uh, you know, the, it, again, it doesn't take the big wins, but if you can just get out there and start exploring. Now, if you've got, and Brian, you can speak to this, but I've got, uh, but I, my feeling is that for some of these programs, you don't have to buy the package to start with. They have small free test ones you can start doing proof of concept on. Mm-hmm. So that when we come to this particular part of it, that's what I would say you need to do. Yeah, and, and just to, so for the folks listening, if they're looking at NICE has a free trial online, 
Automation Studio. UiPath has a community edition online that has a, some good functionality in it. And Power Automate is built into a lot of Microsoft stuff um, that you might already have a free copy to. And they all have their strengths and weaknesses and, and limitations, but it's very easy to get started and get early wins with almost no cost. Right, that latter one, the one you talked about that's built into Microsoft. We talked to a gentleman from New Zealand who works in audit who's just doing some incredible stuff. He was using the one, I'm looking at you over to the side, can you tell? He was using <laughs> the one, uh, I believe that was the free one. He, at, least he st yeah, at least he started with that when he was doing proof of concept for his audit department. And he, talking to him, we just were like, how are you doing all this and amazing stuff he was doing. And again, this is kind of that citizen developer who used the free tools that just started doing it and became a champion within the organization. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, and I'm often reminded uh, by Fern Carbonell, who is our operations manager at Rogue Tulips, uh, do the demo, do the free trial. Let me check it out first before you, you know, mm -hmm. commit to spending money on something. And I think that's something we always forget is like, give it a trial first. Um, that's a great tip. So Agnes, what, what are you thinking at this point? I think I'm just gonna take a, a brief different approach to this and, and just addressing that fear factor. I, mean, I opine that the creative process is what will really protect you know, workers from being replaced by robots. So if you have that thought process in mind that, you know, by embracing creativity and intelligent automation, you're actually doing yourself a favor. There's nothing to fear because that process would allow you uh, not to be replaced by a robot, but to allow you to really express you know, some of those great ideas of citizen development, citizens developer and, and all that great concepts that come out of the creativity table. That's a great concept because uh, a lot of what you are seeing in the literature about, about internal audit and all this is, wait a minute, we're gonna lose our jobs. What's gonna happen to us and all that? To be honest with you, if you in internal audit are fearful that this is going to replace you, then you, it's a bad way to put it. You should be replaced. You're not doing anything. <laughs> uh, you know, again, this is replacing the clickety click with a thinkity think. I, I love that person. You know, if all you're doing is ticking and tying and filling out, and this this really goes to any position now beyond internal audit. Mm -hmm. Do not see this as, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to sit and push buttons anymore. Mm -hmm. It has to be sold as, oh my gosh, I get to use my brain now. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I love that's an excellent point, Agnes. I'm mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. I love that because the tools are only as good as the person using them. That's correct. Yeah, and I'd say this too. One of the things organizationally that I find is interesting is there's usually somebody in that organization who loves this stuff. Mm -hmm. They love exploring. They love learning. They love being creative. They, they want to go take these trainings. They probably, in my experience, they do it on their own time at home when I give them the information and stuff. And then they come to work and tell their boss, right? And, and that usually goes over really well. Um, hey, look what I can do, right? Mm -hmm. So there's usually someone in there who's be much happier doing this type of work. Um, I think every organization's got at least one of them. So I'd say start with that person at, at the worst, right? Find that person who's interested. You know, it's a great message to any leader, manager, supervisor, whoever. Maybe you don't feel comfortable with it. There is somebody working for you who is. Mm -hmm. Find that person and give them, you know, that opportunity. You know, and, and I'm a big supporter of that. Uh, when I've worked with uh, teams that I've managed or led, I, the same thing. You know, hey, you want to try it? Run with it. Mm -hmm. You know, come back and, and tell me what happened. Um, and I'm also that person who's like, let me try this and see if it works. You know, yes. uh, so it's I'm a process of uh, it's that process of empowerment and empowering others as well. So I think yeah. it makes a lot of sense. So. Well, and I think that kind of brings us to, you know, we're, we're getting close to the end of our supersize episode, but um, it kind of brings us also to that thing of uh, the process of elimination, right? Mm -hmm. So you're trying these different things and well, okay, I know this one doesn't work and I know this one doesn't work. So let me find the other one. And, and that's also part of the creative process. When Mike's been on before, we've just talked about creativity and who our favorite creatives were. And Twyla Tharp is a favorite of both Mike and myself, uh, the, her book, The Creative Habit, because it's mm -hmm. really a process. Creativity is also a process. So mm -hmm. how, how can we encourage people and, and jump in, whoever would like to jump in, how can we encourage people to take that same process thinking and apply it to their creativity? Because that just brings us back to finding that best tool. Mm. What? I, I was thinking dice coin toss i'm not real sure 
I love it. What I mean is, I, how do we encourage people to approach the creativity as a process in itself? You know, mm -hmm. there's a broader point to that whole thing. When creativity is dying or not there, it is usually from fear. Mm -hmm. Part of that fear is internal fear. You know, I'm not going to step forward. Um, there's a, you know, long story about Linda Berry, who's a creative cartoonist and all that. But the line is, the demon is failure. Mm -hmm. And so that, that failure that we have internally, that becomes our demon to keep us from doing things. Wow, this got deep. But also, <laughs> are you setting an environment? Yes. Are you the demon? Are you the one killing this so that, you know, this is, this is old hat, but it's still true. Mm -hmm. Do you celebrate failures? Mm -hmm. And unless you are doing that, you will not build that creativity. And it has to be an environment of creativity of all kinds that then lets this idea of automation build within it. You know, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on your point, Mike, but um, I, I get very excited about discussing failure because I, I have developed a saying over the last four years. Everybody talks about failure, but nobody wants to talk about failure. Mm. So you hear people say, address your fail, fail fast, fail forward. But then when you want to talk to somebody about like, hey, I'm a failed CEO. Mm. No, no, don't connect your name with failure. Okay, so we're supposed to take Edison's attitude, I guess. I just know 99 ways not to build the light bulb. But sometimes mm. things are just epic fails. Like, you know, lately we've had all the billionaire astronaut or wannabe astronauts. They've changed the definition, which is another conversation. But you've mm. had all these billionaires building rockets and going out of the atmosphere. You know, any of those rockets could have blown up. Absolutely. They could have been an epic failure. They got in those things not having any idea of if it was going to blow up or not. Mm -hmm. These are guys who are not afraid of failure. They take an idea and it may take them a long time to make that idea happen. Like I had no idea it took Richard Branson 20 years to get his rocket built. Mm -hmm. And often, yep. often it's always the case that when you fail in certain areas, a new creativity, a new idea comes out of that failure and it becomes a whole brand new business. So, you know, it's I, in many ways, I think I do agree with you, Cecilia, that maybe there's an opportunity here as the association community uh, to look at failure differently. And to Mike's point, let's celebrate it because out of that proportion comes something bigger than yourselves, uh, you know, and, and I, I, it, it's a different shift in mindset. But I think it's a shift that we all need to embrace, whether as an association community or as a global community. And, and all that we are, it's just that it's not sinking in the way it should. But it, I think you're right. It's definitely a discussion, a coffee discussion around our strategy meetings that needs to happen. Yeah. I had the opportunity to be at a Christmas party for an organization that I was not a part of, a smaller organization, but they literally gave awards, joking awards, for mm -hmm. people's failures throughout the year. Now, that takes a certain culture to pull off. Mm -hmm. The CEO did that, but they were celebrating, oh my gosh, look at the mistakes we all make. Mm -hmm. They're fun. They're exciting. They, you know, let's just keep moving. Uh, to have a culture where you can get away with that takes quite a bit, but nonetheless, it was a great exhibit of failure isn't a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I sometimes was... failure is the only option. Sorry, Bryant, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I love this conversation. Just want to jump in. We we, uh, we experience in, in teaching students and developing automations. There's a lot of ways to fail before you succeed, and that's valuable and useful, and and that's great. And and I do think it's it's hard to have this discussion about going on an automation or an innovation journey mm -hmm. without embracing failure. The the other side to that coin I'd like to offer though that I think is also worth considering, especially given given our audience, is the concept of service. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we find that. Where failure scares us, service makes us happy. And when we're allowed to serve more, you know, we tend, especially the folks who gravitate to this type of stuff, tend to feel better. And I, I think service is a very, um, maybe less sexy way of innovating as mm -hmm. you just think of how do I just help more and more people? Um, and I think we're finding that when we're developing automations and we're, we're building solutions, we're really just happy because we, we think of ourselves, how happy is that person going to be when they don't have to do this? Or how, you know, how much better is it that they're going to have 24 seven access? And, mm -hmm. and I, and I think that that might also help combat fear sometimes mm. too. 
Love that. Well, yes. this, despite this being a supersized episode, it too, unfortunately, needs to come to an end. Uh, so we're at the end of our scheduled time. Uh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> but we usually do just a quick wrap up, wrap up at the end. So uh, closing thought and how can people get in touch with you? So Mike, quick closing thought and how can people reach out to you? And then we'll throw it over to Brian. Try everything, do everything, do not be afraid. Failure is not an issue. Be creative, find creatives around you and surround yourselves with them. You can contact me at mjaka, J-A-C-K-A, at FPEX, that's Flying Pig Audit Consulting Training Solutions dot com. And I'm also on uh, FD Gray if you want to follow me on Twitter. Excellent, great. And over to you, Brian. Sure, the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. We all Mm. need to start our automation journeys, however that takes shape. But please do not miss the opportunity to go down that path. It's very important to the successes and futures of our of our organizations. Uh, if you're ever looking for help or support, commiseration, whatever it is, you can find me at bryant.richards at nichols.edu. And by all means, please, you can find me on LinkedIn um, and, and connect away. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Brian. And Agnes, closing thought? Well, I just want to appreciate uh, Brian and Mike for joining us. Great conversation. I think we need to do this again. Uh, We'd like to have you back on our show and uh, just appreciate you for your insights to our global community. Great. Thank you, Agnes. And uh, we all have to go rogue for now, uh, but I want to thank our guests, Mike Jacka and Brian Richards, for this really fun conversation on intelligent automation and creativity and how those two intersect. If you want to learn more about Rogue Tulips, you can check us out online at our website, roguetulips.com. And we encourage you to check out our sister company, the 501C League, which is an organization supporting the professional development of everyone in the nonprofit community and the people who love them. You can check out the league at the 501Cleague.net. So thanks for joining us this week, and we'll be back next time with another exciting conversation.